The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. The word believe causes all sorts of problems. Too many people treat their belief in God like their belief in free speech, some kind of license to be obnoxious without taking responsibility for the damage they do. How much hurt has been inflicted upon others because of what someone believes, even claims to religious freedom, run the risk of becoming veiled attempts at discrimination and prejudice. And I just say the word believe isn't especially helpful to preachers either. For often my job seems to fall in the category of a persuasive appeal that even now I'm trying to convince a rather skeptical audience you need to embrace and believe in or at least intellectually consent to the existence of God and to persuade you that all this talk about faith is really real. Now if that's the goal of what I do when I preach, then you tell me, do I ever succeed? I think, if anything, what preaching is about is to open ourselves up more freely to truths that we've already been told and say we believe. An effective sermon has to pick a lot of locks over the span of about 15 minutes. And if Yoda in Star Wars was correct, the first step of learning is to unlearn what we've learned previously. Another way to say it is, so much of who we've been in the past prevents us from becoming who God is calling us to become in the present. Of course, all of our operating theologies or beliefs beliefs in God always need adjustment along the way, but the best sermons do more than challenge the mind. They urge us to listen again to what most of us have heard before, perhaps with the simple goal to help us stop resisting the claims God makes to us, about us, and around us. So in our gospel lesson, the word believe is used five times. The Greek word is pistuo. But I want to suggest that for today, we substitute the word believe with the word trust. For that is what Jesus is asking his hearers to do, to trust that in him, God has given a gift of love. Jesus urges them to commit themselves to that reality and all that it involves. Trust will change a person, for God's love has a direct impact on our lives. And so John 3.16, reworded, comes out as, For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who trusts in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. How does one merely believe in love anyway? Believing in love is comfortable. Trust is riskier. Trusting in another's love entails surrender. Now, I can place a chair in front of you and ask if you believe it will hold you up. Looking at it, you would probably say yes. But to sit in it is a very different action than believing and requires within you not simply a concept in your head, but something you do with your body, sitting on it, placing your weight on it, that is an act of trust. One step beyond belief. We'll translate that metaphor. How many of us have placed ourselves in a love that we thought was certain, only to feel that chair collapse beneath us, feeling foolish, hurt, and angry, left only with a broken heart? 
And so when it comes to John 3.16, a verse that you have heard a thousand times before, in order to understand it differently, you must recognize that this whole entire thing about God's love for you and God's love for me is not just a matter of belief, but a matter of placing ourselves directly in the center of that love, trusting that like the chair, it will hold us up it will sustain us, protect us even. It invites from us action, not, to sh not just intellectual assent. Love's power is how it calls us to itself and that involves vulnerability, it involves risk. And that's why I think it's sometimes difficult to preach and to receive the message of preaching because it's not easy to open ourselves up to that kind of love that John's Gospel celebrates, a love that originates in God and is directed toward the whole world. For one thing, the world that Jesus describes in John is so undeserving. It revels in its own selfish kind of love, dwelling in shadows and perpetuating evil. And it's so hard to believe. No, it's hard to trust that God's love will be able to make a difference and really draw people out into the warm daylight of God's embrace. Take, for example, those in our culture who claim to be Christian, and yet their version of Christianity, their misguided truth, their manipulation of the gospel that they would like to superimpose on the rest of us is a Christianity that oppresses and excludes. It takes away the rights of many, creates division, binds up and oppresses. It is a slap in the face of God who loves and counterintuitive the good news of the gospel that seeks to liberate and release. Everyone may believe that it's good to love their neighbor, but putting that belief into action is an entirely different thing. And recognize too, it's difficult to open ourselves up to God's love, sometimes because of a troubled past. I mean, after all, we've all been burned before we have We've all had our hearts broken. Many of us stopped trusting people a long time ago. And so you can imagine that we project onto God all that woundedness, all that heartache, and we remain closed to the love of God. God in love says, trust me. And we find ourselves unable to do that. It's not as though the love of God was wasted on the world. But the evidence suggests that such love hasn't really caught on here as something to imitate. Why does the love of God fall short of wooing us into deeper connection with God? It seems at times it just doesn't play well or love just falls flat in a world of resistance. It's a huge challenge to open ourselves up to God's love, to take one step beyond simply believing in it, but trusting in it too. For when we trust love, it fosters courage and encourages self-giving. Of course, that doesn't come easy. Trust wavers, and that's why I keep preaching, and it may be why you keep listening, because we need often reminders of its persistence and attraction. But it's more than the preaching. It's the Spirit of God wooing us back, always to God's self, as if we were fickle lovers that God refuses to let go of. Well, life has a way of bringing us to the brink. We've all come close to the edge of the cliff. We've leaned out over the precipice and realized it's a long way down. Now, I'm not suggesting that we would jump, but that life's difficulties have pushed us at times to a near breaking point. And suddenly we are filled with this feeling of wanting to give up, to give in. Life is not easy under the best of circumstances, but under the chronic and enduring stress that we know as humans, it seems at times to be damn near impossible. But every time, every single time, God calls us back away from that edge into something life-giving. For God's love is magnetic. Its power is desire. It will draw you out and draw you in, always pulling you toward some new possibility, some new insight, some new discovery. Even in the darkest days, God's love, at the very least, heightens 
our desire for something more than what life sometimes has to offer. Well, allow me to explain this idea of desire just a little bit further by talking about St. Augustine. He was a fascinating and complex man, an influential early Christian theologian. August, Augustine spoke of passionate friendships with men and speaks in his writings rather openly of his bisexuality. He also possessed relatively compassionate recognition of gender diversity, and yet he's often blamed for the misogynist anti-sex attitude that runs through much of church history. His life and work show that Christians have wrestled with questions of sexuality and gender identity and expression since antiquity. But Augustine wrote this about desire. Give me a lover and let him feel what I am saying. Give me one who yearns. Give me one who hungers. Give me one like this and he will know what I am saying. And then he goes on to say that God's revelation is not a message in a bottle like bits of information sent across the abyss to be received by the intellect. Rather, God's self-revelation is a magnet for desire. This revelation, Augustine writes, is what draws. You show a green branch to a sheep and you draw her. Candy is shown to a boy and he is drawn. Well, in the same way, God's love is what draws us. By being loved by God, we are drawn to something more. God's desire for us, God's love for us, activates our own desire to live, to laugh, and to love God back, and to love others as well. Should we give ourselves over to that desire or remain aloof and distant? All this is to say that God's intention for you is to do more than just believe. It is for you to trust, for it is in trusting that your belief becomes more than just an intellectual understanding. Another way to say it is putting your trust in God shows that your believing in God was real in the first place, for God's magnetic love draws you to itself, inviting you to place yourself in the very current of that love, there to be swept downstream. It requires a tremendous amount of vulnerability and risk. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, realized that it wasn't his 600 and something rules of Jewish law that would save him. And so in the middle of the night, in the cover of darkness, because he was afraid others would see him, he came to Jesus. And in that encounter, he discovered love, God's love. But that love was more than simply something to believe in. It was a law in which he would place his very being. In other words, it was a love he would trust, not just believe. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son that everyone who trusts in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Amen.